In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Many of you probably don't know this, but my mother is buried in the churchyard here. My mother and dad converted to orthodoxy in their mid-70s. I'm 76, so they were about my age. And I still have to tell you a little funny antidote here. Father Gregory was their priest. And so one day, my mother called me and she said, we just found out that there are seven other former liturgical church organists in our parish. And one of these women said, well, we have enough that we could actually establish a chapter of the American Guild of Organists. And Father Gregory over here said, no, the American Guild of Recovery Organists. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, it is. <laughs> my mother told me that. <laughs> I want to tell you just a little bit about my mother because I'm speaking on motherhood. My mother was a treasure trove. Um, all of my good taste in food and in interior design came from my mother. My mother was a classy woman. She became a church organist in uh, Spokane at Trinity Lutheran Church on Wellesley. She wasn't even Lutheran, but they hired her. And then eventually we moved to Sandpoint, and uh, my mother became the organist at First Lutheran in Sandpoint. When I, my background is, uh, other than the shady part that I won't talk about, uh, my background is uh, as, as I was, uh, I taught psychology in a small college in Portland, and I was also a therapist. And so you can imagine my shock when I announced to my parents that I was going to be, that I was becoming Orthodox and that I was going to be a monk. And the first time that I visited my parents here in Hurtle Lane, and my mother saw me walk in, she almost well, if she had been younger, she would have had a miscarriage. <laughs> she was so upset. And in fact, I remember what she said to me. She said, you're like one of those hippies. You grew your hair and beard long, and you're wearing weird clothes, and you smell of incense. <laughs> and I knew that giving my parents icons or books on orthodoxy was not going to help. And so what I did is, from my heart, I asked God to help me be the very best son I could be to my parents. So I called them regularly. I came to see them as often as I could come to Coeur d'Alene. My mother, as a therapist, my mother would always let me take them out to a really nice restaurant here in Coeur d'Alene. But all of a sudden, oh, I'll fix you something that you really like. I knew what it was. She didn't want to be seen publicly with me. <laughs> and uh, so that went on for some time. My mother was embarrassed at how I looked and dressed. Well, that was during the time when uh, the white supremacists were, were, everybody around the country knew about Northern Idaho as having those white supremacists. Nobody in Northern Idaho knew about them, because they were just a tiny little group of people, but everybody else knew. So when I would come to visit my parents, people were so nice to me. And part of it, I'm sure, is that they thought I was a rabbi. And they wanted to prove they were not anti-Semitic. I even had someone ask me once, or say shalom to me. <laughs> rabbi, shalom. And I said, well, thank you for the peace, but I am not a rabbi. I'm not even Jewish. And they said, oh, we thought you were a Jew for Jesus. <laughs> so, my, my mother and dad, my mother finally one day when we were sitting in their dining room and we were eating the food that she had prepared, my mother had been changing. She had become more crabby. And I asked her one day, Mom, why are you unhappy? Oh, I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine. And I looked at my dad and, and 
and my dad rolled his eyes. And anybody that knew my dad, Big Al was his nickname, knew that that's exactly what he would do. And so he rolled his eyes, and I said, seriously, Mom, what's going on? And she said, well, the Lutheran church that we go to has lost every sense of reverence. And we're going to start looking for another Lutheran church. And I said, Mom, you've been to every Lutheran church in Coeur d'Alene. Every one of them, even the Missouri Synod, Christ the King Church, has no reverence. And, they have, and I said, in fact, Christ the King Church looks like a modern state house. And it's in the round. And when you went there, they were having praise services. And my mother had, you know, been a liturgical church organ. And then I looked at my dad and I, I said, why don't you guys go to St. John the Baptist? It's not very far from where you live. And my mother said, well, maybe someday. And I looked at my dad and I said, dad, who's the head of a Christian household? <laughs> well, the husband, of course. Where are you going on Sunday? St. John the Baptist Orthodox Church. And my mother giggled. And that they came here. And that, sun, that Sunday afternoon, my mother called, and she said that when people at this parish found out that they were Abbot Trifon's parents, they were treated like celebrities. And it wasn't for, I think, a few months that they became catechumens, and eventually Father Gregory and I baptized them together. I love Father Gregory. He is my brother, and I'm going to be preaching at his church tomorrow. In Bonasperi. So here's the thing. Oh, the, the final thing from my mother was, oh, I have, um, you can park in the garage. I told your dad to park on the street so it's more convenient for you to come into the kitchen. <laughs> yes, Mom, thank you for your consideration. And of course, she didn't want the neighbors to see me walking in. But once they became orthodox and they realized the respect that you people have for your priests, they changed. And my mother completely reversed everything. They became enthusiastic and then they wanted to go out. And, you know, I had to struggle to find the money to do it, but I would take them out. <laughs> what I want to suggest to you, all of you, and, and, I, and I, this is from my heart to you mothers. There is a saying in orthodoxy that a whole family of unbelievers or people who are not practicing the faith can be saved by the prayers of their mother. And think about the power of the Holy Virgin and her prayers. Think about that. In my own sadness as to what's happening in the Ukraine, and between two great Orthodox countries. I finally decided it's better that I not watch the news because it was killing me. So what I did, and what I do every day at the monastery, our church, by the way, the monastery's temple is de dedicated to the protection of the Holy Virgin. So every day at, at Matins, I light a large candle in front of the icon of the Holy Virgin protection. Shane, who's uh, an iconographer in this area, uh, painted this beautiful icon of the Holy Protection that's over the doors of our church. So I rely on her. And the wonderful thing for Orthodox women is that you have in the image of the Holy Virgin the archetype of what you should be. You are, have your own way of having your protective veil over your children and your grandchildren. You are the ones who pray and keep families together. As an example of this, during the Soviet period, when Stalin had killed most of the priests and monastics and bishops, and when he had Christ the Savior Cathedral, which he could see from his Kremlin office, imploded because it offended him. 
And then they found that they couldn't build on that site the high building that they wanted, so they turned it into the world's largest heated swimming pool. What they didn't expect was in the wintertime, often the shape of an onion dome would come up over this heated swimming pool. And grandmothers would secretly bring their grandchildren there to be baptized by themselves because no priest was allowed to have any contact with children whatsoever. You could not bring a young person or a child into a church during that time. And now we have seen the resurrection of orthodoxy in Russia to the degree that there is an average of three new churches built every day throughout Russia. Within 10 years, it's been estimated that there will be more churches and monasteries in Russia than there were before the revolution when they were all destroyed. I want to say something to you about, and many of you probably are aware of the elder, the, uh, Thaddeus, who did a great book, which I recommend all the time, Our Thoughts Determine Our Lives. If you haven't read the book, read it. This morning, early this morning, I, I, that was a book I brought with me, and I was running out of time and so I made the sign of the cross over the book and made the sign of the cross over myself and I opened it like that. And this is what was there at the tip of my finger. Everything on this earth revolves around some kind of service. Every type of work on this earth is God's work. All work should be performed from the heart. And then he said these words, because I did it the second time and pointed after I moved table, uh, pages that I wasn't looking at. Strictness towards others can be dangerous. We must be kind and merciful towards others. Our relationships, you've alluded to this, depend on this. And women must initiate the love and holiness of the Mother of God. My sister, not of the flesh, but Mother Markella of Life Giving Spring Monastery in Dunlap, California, she and I have been very, very close for many, many years. And I was there about eight months ago, I think. And uh, during Trapeza, Mother Markella stood up and said to her nuns, about 25 of them, I think. She said, I haven't heard anything from my brother in Greece for over 20 years. So at this moment in time, I'm replacing my Greek brother in Greece without a Trayvon. He is now my brother. And then I got to see a tour that no other man has seen in that monastery from the inner side. She also told me, and Father Gregory might not remember this, but he was there. I remember you and your wife were there. I went to say goodbye to her after I had given, um, I, I've been there for the Orthodox Christian Fellowship, the Young People's uh, College Work Organization. And I went to say goodbye to her. And she stood up right in front of you two. And she said, Father, <clears throat> she said, Father Trefal is responsible for two of my nuns being here because when they were 12-year-old girls, they visited the monastery from, from um, All Saints Church Camp on one of the islands in the Puget Sound. And these 
two little 12-year-old girls decided they wanted to be nuns because of my Athenite beard trick. Now, back then, my beard was quite substantial. It's, with age, I've gotten shorter and my beard has gotten shorter. But I would use, I used to put my beard up to the top of my head like this with a scupa on and I put John Lennon dark sunglasses on. <laughs> you could not see my face. And I did that with the kids. And I remember that time because there was a priest there who was, made a comment to me afterwards. He says, Father Trevon, if you continue to do this, nobody will take you seriously. <laughs> well, that wasn't my intent to be taken seriously. I was doing this for the kids. And so, two of these 12-year-old girls became nuns at Mother Markella's monastery. And one of them told me that when she turned 32 and was going to go join the monastery, she came out to, the monast to our monastery and asked if I would once again do my beard trick. <laughs> I also have to tell you that uh, my, bun, my bond with Mother Markella was amplified when, as an, as an abbess, you should kiss the hand of an abbess and ask her, ask her blessing. But every time I would try to kiss her hand, she would yank it away. So one day, I'm in the trapezoma, and she comes in. I was being force-fed, by the way. She says, oh, no, you have to eat, you have to eat. So I'm sitting there, I'm not hungry, but I'm eating, yes, mother. And she comes in and I stand up and she takes her right hand and she places it on the back of the chair that I had been sit sitting in. And so I tapped the top of her hand as I'm talking to her. And then when I knew that she was completely distracted, I grabbed her wrist, <laughs> held it on, and I kissed her hand. And she said, you tricked me. <laughs> and all the nuns that were there that witnessed this laughed. <laughs> and now she is my sister, the sister that I never had, I now have. This holy woman that I feel so blessed to know and to love. So what I want to say to all of you, and where's Lenny? Okay, am I getting near the... You're perfect. Okay, well not perfect, but... Well, close, okay. close because you know, Lenny is she who is to be obeyed. <laughs> <laughs> so if I see her go like this, then I will bring it to a sudden end, so I will not be in trouble. You all know that a husband is the head of the household, but we don't always talk about it. The woman is the neck. <laughs> and I've seen so many examples of that. But what I, what I say to all of you is that you are, by your very presence in the church, an image of the Holy Virgin. And you need to remember that. That you as women are not secondary to the body of Christ, just as the Holy Virgin is the first among all the saints. There is no saint that comes near her as we venerate. No, none whatsoever. And you can imagine as having been raised Lutheran and then eventually in college and graduate school becoming not only a atheist, but becoming a leftist member of the Socialist Workers Party, <laughs> So I have watched with great sadness what I see has happened in our cities, especially Portland and Seattle, over the last year or more. Once I pulled in in front of the federal building at five o'clock, just when they were about to start burning again, and I saw a federal agent, and I 
and I pulled out my black, my uh, sheriff's chaplain's badge, big, big gold badge, and I pulled it out and I held it up, and I said, I want you to know that I'm on your side. I am a police and fire chaplain, but I want to give you some encouragement to, for you to know that at one time, I was on their side. And I let them know that there was a time back in the late 70s that I was one of the people with a bullhorn leading a thousand people through the streets. And I was one of them that was planning to bring down Western civilization with a race riot. And we were a race war. And we, we didn't have members of the black community in our central committee but we were planning on using them. So when I first saw this thing about Black Lives Matter, and I went online and discovered their website, and discovered that the three women that founded it are self-declared Marxists. So I wasn't surprised, because I recognized all of them. What we are all called to do is to be in service to others and to love everyone regardless of age, regardless of religion, regardless of color. We're, we're called to love everyone. One of my closest friends is Father Moses Berry, a black man. And they have a son, he and his wife have a son that lives on Bashan Island, and every summer they come and they spend a week or two. And during the day when their son is working, they sit on our veranda, not what I've been to the south, I call a big part of veranda, <laughs> and we drink mint juleps, and we bonded closely as brothers. So we refer to each other as brothers from a different mother. And we mean it. We mean it. Staying at the hotel today, they're in the, in the lobby, before I was to be picked up, there was a, a wedding party, and the bride was black. And at one point, sitting where I was in the coffee house shop area, I noticed this black woman elegantly attired with this long, beautiful gown. And I made a comment to her about what a beautiful gown she was wearing. And we had this wonderful interaction. And she said, I'm going to tell the bride what you said, that I was rejoicing and that I blessed her through the koi. <laughs> I was on the inside of the koi, the giant koi, and they were on the outside. And I blessed her. <laughs> it went right straight through the koi, I could tell. And I saw the moon. <laughs> So, one of the best ways that we can share our orthodoxy, and I'm specifically speaking to you women now, is by the joy in our hearts. Because nothing speaks of the truth of orthodoxy more than people witnessing the joy of Christ in our lives. It's not about being religiously correct. Years ago, when I was still in the Bay Area, <coughs> Father Paul and I decided to go into Lake County for their passion play. We parked about maybe a mile away on this road and we're walking along towards this big arena where they have this huge passion play and they have mules and they have uh, horses and they have people dressed like Roman soldiers and on our way I was amazed at how many and we were dressed like this and I was amazed at how many people said oh you're in the play <laughs> and uh, I thought that's really strange so we get there and we are all seated for clergy down front on chairs and you can imagine my horror when I saw the play begin and 
the Pharisees were all dressed in black. <laughs> and they had these rounded hats on with black veils. And I looked at Father Paul and I said, no wonder they thought we were Pharisees. And then, after that, I thought about the story of the publican and the Pharisee and how the publican is in the back of the temple behind the pillar beating his breast and saying, Lord have mercy on me a sinner. And where is the Pharisee? He's up front with his hands raised up thanking God that I am not like other men, like say that publican over there. And then I thought, oh my gosh, we Orthodox priests in our services raise our hands and we're dressed to the 90s you might say for those older people here and i'm thinking and we do rituals and the pharisees did that when christ condemned the pharisees it wasn't what they were doing because he and his apostles did the same thing it was the motive behind it and we Orthodox have to be very, very careful that the motivation behind our living the life as Orthodox Christians isn't about ritual or about the letter of the law. It is about the heart. And I can't think of any group of people in the church that more exemplify that truth than women. I can't think of anyone else. The rest of us try hard, but it's you women that really do it. And I remember once telling the, well, I won't say which denomination on the island because if she sees, she sees it, she might be upset. And I've already had enough people on that island upset. <laughs> Bless their hearts. <laughs> But, as Orthodox Christians, <clears throat> if people don't see the love of Christ in us, then all the rest of what we do is noise. It's just noise. And you women are the ones And you women are the ones that are leading us in this joyful entrance into the heart of God. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen.